So uh, I now invite uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador uh, Hugo Astuto, our keynote speaker for the day, to uh, deliver his keynote address. Excellency, uh, in your keynote address, we would like you to address some specific questions. Uh, as pointed out earlier, the India-EU summit has been widely seen as an exercise in transformational diplomacy. Can you briefly focus on two or three transformational outcomes of the summit, which will shape India-EU relations over the next decade? Secondly, uh, Excellency, we are meeting at a time of the festering pandemic in India, which is ruthlessly rampaging across the country. In this interlinked world, no country can afford to be an island. Uh, as you recall, BM, Prime Minister Modi sought the support, uh, support of the EU for the India-South Africa back proposal for TRIPS waiver for vaccines. Given the urgency of the situation, can one expect a change in the EU's position the coming weeks? Over to you, Excellency Origios. Able to address this. Uh, let me simply share with you a few highlights of the of the summit, as, as I see it. And let me start by thanking you for inviting me. It, it's a pleasure to be here with you and with uh, friends. Um, I, I think I can make a, a long story short. Uh, by starting to say that the, the meeting has been extremely successful. Um, it has been described as a, a turning point or an historic meeting. And I think this is a, a fair assessment. Uh, the meeting has been outstanding, both in terms of general atmosphere, and when it comes to the concrete deliverables. Uh, to start with uh, a very strong message of solidarity emerged from the meeting. Uh, it has taken place against the backdrop uh, of the COVID crisis. And um, there was a clear renewed commitment by all member states um, to support India uh, in this difficult moment, just like India supported the rest of the world in the past few months by keeping supply chains open, exporting pharmaceutical uh, ingredients and, um, and vaccines. As, as you may know, the European Union has activated the civil protection mechanism at the end of April. And there has been a massive response from all member states. So as we speak, uh, deliveries have taken place of uh, oxygen-related equipment, other critical medical equipment and uh, antiviral medicines for up to around 100 million euros, which makes this one of the most uh, significant operations undertaken by the EU civil protection mechanism so far. Well, when it comes to the outcomes of the, of the meeting, probably one of the most significant has been the decision to resume negotiations on an ambitious, comprehensive and mutually beneficial free trade agreement, as well as to start negotiations uh, on a standalone investment agreement, and also on an agreement on geographical indications. Well, in parallel, the, the commitment has been taken to address market access issues and to work together jointly on our broad economic agenda. Uh, working groups have been established to deal with uh, topical issues such as WTO reform, uh, regulatory uh, issues, and the resilience of global supply chains. So, as we all know, the European Union today is already one of the largest trade and investment partners of India. Uh, but at the, at the meeting, we have agreed on a broad and comprehensive economic agenda so that we can fully unleash the potential of this economic partnership. 
And at the same time, we want to work together with India in international forum in order to shape the global agenda. For instance, when it comes to WTO reform, or work together within the G20 framework. At the, at the leaders' meeting, a connectivity partnership that was also established. It's, it's a partnership which has set very clear principles which define connectivity as we want it to be implemented. So with full transparency, uh, inclusiveness, sustainable connectivity, sustainable in terms of, um, of its fiscal parameters, but also environmentally sustainable and socially sustainable. Uh, we've also identified specific areas for, for common endeavors with, with India on connectivity, including the, the traditional ones such as transport and energy, but also innovative dimensions such as, such as digital, digital connectivity, and clearly people-to-people -people connectivity, which, which in a way underpins the whole of um, uh, EU-India uh, relationship. Uh, the day before, uh, the, the leaders meeting, the European Investment Bank signed some, some additional financing contract on sustainable mobility, including for the Pune Metro. And I think that's significant because the European Investment Bank, I'm sure, will prove a, a very significant tool in the implementation of our connectivity partnership. Um, the, the EU leaders, um, and the Prime Minister and Prime Minister Modi have also referred to EU-India uh, cooperation on um, climate change, on the fight against climate change, against biodiversity loss, and for the greening of our um, economies. And, uh, this has been described as potentially the most important dimension of our relationship. And, and I think it's very true. In the, sense, in the sense that it's, um, it reflects a common interest, but also the pursuit of a global common good for the European Union and India. We have resumed our climate dialogue. Uh, the, the, the first edition of this, uh, of this climate dialogue has taken place just before um, the leaders' meeting. And we want to work together to make COP26 in Glasgow a success. And the European Union already works with India in, in the framework, for instance, of the International Thoral Alliance or the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. And we want to continue to do so. I think these flagship Indian initiatives are an example of what India can do in fostering a global agenda oriented towards um, the greening of our economic models. Um, and it, Important outcomes are also to be recorded when it comes to the digital transition. I think the green and digital transition are priorities which are shared by both India and the European Union. We, we, we want to cooperate, for instance, on high performance computing. And, and specifically, we have identified the, the issue of uh, uh, research when it comes to COVID and extreme weather events. And we also want to, um, um, to work together on artificial intelligence and, um, and, and to hold a digital, a high level digital forum. This, this will all contribute to the strengthening of our cooperation on, on the digital um, transition. Uh, there are also other um, dimensions, such as the rollout of, um, of 5G networks or the issue of data protection, where, where the UN and India can work together, particularly since we are both democracies and open societies. So in a way, we, we are facing the same challenges. And I think this uh, emerged very clearly uh, when our executive vice president for the digital transition, uh, Mrs. Verstager, participated in the Resina dialogue and had a number of meetings in the side of Resina. So what we have seen is a convergence of interest also when it comes to the digital transition. On, on foreign and security policy, let me recall the, the new um, the focus on the Indo-Pacific. Um, 
following the the council conclusion, EU council conclusion recently adopted, and the drafting of our EU strategy on the Indo-Pacific. You, you can see that also in the framework of our connectivity partnership with India, but also on the broad economic um, bilateral agenda and our drive to, to strengthen cooperation on foreign and security policies. But basically, the European Union is a, is a major stakeholder in the Indo-Pacific, and we want to contribute to its prosperity and, um, and stability. And, and we feel that we share the same principle. We, we believe in a real space, the system of international governance. So we share the same principles with India. And we, we want to work with India in order to foster a cooperative approach to international relations in the, in the region, including when it comes to maritime security and respect for international law. Uh, to, to be noted also, the, the, the joint statement on Afghanistan, which was was released by the foreign minister, by uh, Dr. Jay Shankar and the high representative, Josep Borrell, a few days before the, the leaders' meeting. I, I think that's an example of, um, of strengthened cooperation on foreign and security issues, which uh, we can follow up also on different topics and dimensions based on, on our shared values and, and converging interests. So let, let me conclude here by, again, reiterating it was um, an excellent meeting, the very positive atmosphere, also with a number of very symbolic gestures, including the, let me recall, the Prime Minister of Portugal holding his um, overseas citizens of India card. And um, let me also recall here what the Prime Minister Modi said, that the European Union and India can together be a force multiplier for global good in the 21st century. I think that's a very apt definition indeed. And um, with your permission, I will close here. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for that overarching view of the of the summit and you know the landmark outcomes it has produced. Uh, are you able to listen to me now? You can. Yes, Is now I do. Yes, uh, because now you now probably you'll reduce the volume. Okay, Excellency, the question which I was going to ask you, I and mean, if you could answer briefly, in India there is a lot of interest in, you know, as you know, we are going through a very deadly second wave of the pandemic and other parts of the world are also suffering. Uh, the global equitable access to vaccines has become an all-important issue. I mean, can we expect the EU to change its stance on India-South Africa proposal for TRIPS exemption on IPR? I mean, what is the way forward on this issue, important issue? Over to you. Look, I, I think we are ready to discuss. I think it's an important conversation we must have, um, including as the WTO. Uh, we, we, we share the same initial proposition, let's say, with India, which is that we, we need to face, to address this crisis um, with an attitude grounded in solidarity, in global solidarity. And, and I think both the European Union and India have demonstrated that with concrete deeds. Uh, India has been exporting vaccines in the neighboring and beyond. And so as the European Union, we have actually exported almost as many vaccines as we use domestically, around 200 million doses. And uh, as you probably know, the European Union has also been leading the, the COVAX initiative, which aims at uh, delivering vaccines all around the world where they are needed, irrespective of where one leaves. We, we have been a driving force behind the creation of COVAX, and we are one of the leading contributors. So we we... We, we are all in this together. Uh, we want vaccinations to become, to be readily available at an affordable price uh, worldwide. So we work um, based on this assumption and um, we intend to continue uh, to do so. The priority right now, we believe, is ramping up the manufacturing capacity. We need to increase the capacity worldwide to produce, to manufacture vaccines. That's where our focus.